Hello, Muscat. How are you guys feeling? I know I'm the lucky last speaker, but I'm sure I'll make it worthwhile. Can I get a huge hand of applause, please, for the, all the amazing women? Honestly, I've interviewed some amazing people, but these women that have shared the platform today honestly have inspired me, have taken my breath away. So I want to say a big congratulations to each and every one of you that have, of course, shared and braced us, of course, here on the stage. Now, they asked me, what do I want to talk about today? And I really had to think about it. And I was like, if there is one thing I can leave with the whole world, it would be this philosophy. It's how I live life. And I've been privileged and honored, to be honest, to have met and to have interviewed and to have sat down with some incredible people, likes of Sir Richard Branson, which was one of them. He was incredible. I've met him on numerous occasions and I've got to interview him. Honestly, such a humble, humble man. He's the kind of guy that when I walked in, he got up to shake my hand. Yes, worth around $6 billion, right? He <laughs> would kiss my hand uh, and offered me a cup of tea. And I was the person that was interviewing him. I've, of course, interviewed and spent a lot of time with the likes of Joelle Mandini from the region. I'm sure you guys know who she is as well. An incredible woman. I've also met and interviewed... Jack Maher, who is the founder of Alibaba.com. He's worth around 60 billion, just so you know. Um, I've met and interviewed Chris Gardner. He's an incredible man behind the movie Pursuit to Happiness. I'm sure you guys have watched it. That Will Smith, in fact, plays his character. An incredible story. So you guys need to look him up, Chris Gardner. And of course, some many great celebrities and whatnot, including uh, someone like Lewis Hamilton, who just recently won in the Abu Dhabi Grand Prix last week. <laughs> Having interviewed and met them, I really get to analyze who they are. I don't just get to interview them and ask them a bunch of questions. That's not really my objective. I'm almost like an investigator. I get to analyze everything. What are they doing? How do they act? What is their persona, their charisma? What do they do on a daily basis to make them different? Did you guys ever wonder that? What makes them tick? I kind of came through a little bit of a philosophy. If I said, if I dissected what do they do on a daily basis, then can I implement it into my own world and can I become like them? Right? That was the question I asked myself. And it's true. We can. We can dissect what these people do. On a, daily base, on a daily basis, their attributes, basically, and really find out and then do a copy-paste within us. Do you think that would work? Absolutely. So we're going to do this exercise together. Are you guys ready to play full out? Are you guys ready to get engaged? All right, good. I believe that we live by a line of life. You either choose to live above that line, that's you, yes, or you choose to live under that line. It's a choice. That line of life, however, is average. And someone mentioned, one of our previous speakers mentioned mediocre. If you wish to be mediocre. Who here wants to be mediocre? Come on. No? No show of hands. Good. Who here wants to be average? No one. Is, is, it, is that an interesting life to lead? To be average? Absolutely not. So let's think about the people who live above the line. These are the successful people that are among us, right? The people that I've met. Some of these people are up, up on that screen there. Can you guys give me some names? Give me some names of people that you admire, that you respect, that live above that line. Oprah Winfrey. Tony Robbins. Yes, he's up there. Alan Musk, I've heard. There's a lot of people, right? A lot of examples. I want you guys to visualize these people. What do they do on a daily basis to make them who they are? Let's write this down for a second. What do they do? What are their attributes? Can you call out some, some of these words that may describe them? What do they do on a daily basis that make them who they are? I've got wake up early. All right. So, would you say they, okay, so we'll go wake up early. So, they have a routine, yeah? They have a routine and they stick to it. I heard it's exercise at the front here. Good. What else do they do? Resilient. I love that. Resilient. 
I'll say resilient is got to do with dedication and that leads to persistence. Do you guys all agree? All right, so let's, on that note of resilience, dedication and persistence, I have a story that I want to share with you guys. Who here has heard of the author J.K. Rowling? Show of hands. Oh, we have a lot of Harry Potter fans here. Okay. J.K. Rowling, she's the author of Harry Potter. True? Who here knows her story? We know of her. We know of Harry Potter. But do we know of her story? Let me just share with you guys a couple of minutes of her story for a second. Because for me, this is a very inspirational story that really embodies resilience, dedication, and persistence. Baby girl, just give me one second here. All right. All right. So her story goes by this. She writes the book, Harry Potter. She gets this idea of the wizard while basically traveling on the train. A year develops. She develops a story. She sends it to her friend, and her friend reads it and says, oh, my God, this is an amazing book. You really need to do something with this book. She's like, really? Do I, does it have legs? Yes, it's got legs. You need to send it through to publishers. So she sends it to, and this was back in the day before the internet, right? Come on, baby. Just be patient. Let's put patience on this list. <laughs> patience, Habibi. All right. So she basically gets a book, and this was a time before the internet. So what happened before the internet? How would you get usually contacts before the internet, before Google? Yellow pages, right? She gets the yellow pages out. She lives in the UK, and she finds out the top publishers that are in the UK. And she sends a manuscript to the first publisher, right? And what do you say to them? You say, hell no right? I'm not interested. Let me explain to you why this particular publisher was not interested in Harry Potter. How many pages is Harry Potter, guys? Around 400 pages, true? What category does it sit under? About children's books? Okay, let's think about this for a second. What child is going to want to want, that's going to want to request the book? 400 pages from mum and dad, right? 400 pages. Which child? Show of hands. Not a lot. And what do publishers want to do? They want to make money. So they're thinking proper commercial proposition here, right? So people that live above the line, they're also very commercial. Let me just add that in. Right, so you say no. You're like, what is this? 400 page children book? No, not interested. So she's like, fine, I'll send it to the second publisher. Now, what do you say? And you're like, not interested. She sends it to the third publisher. And what do you say? You say no. Now, by the way, this is months. This was back in the day before the emails where they can just quickly get a response. You have to wait for the letter or a phone call, etc. And by the time the publishers actually got to read it. All right, you send it to the fourth publisher. And what do you say? Not interested. Fifth publisher, what do you say? No. Okay, so let's think about that. It's easy that we've just done this in a couple of seconds, right? Imagine you being rejected now, time over time, from the best people of the industry, not nobodies. We're talking about the industry experts that are giving you no, 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 no. That's five no's now. Now, let's be real, right? Who here would give up at that point? Let's be real. You're getting five no's from industry experts saying, I'm not interested in your book. Are you going to self-doubt yourself? Are you going to question yourself? Yes, of course you would. You're going to be like, maybe my book isn't good enough. True? Let's be real. But she keeps going. And she sends it to the sixth publisher. And what do you say? You say no, even though you're so sweet. I know you want to say yes. She sends it to the seventh publisher. And what do you say? Eighth publisher. What do you say? I know you want to say yes, but what do you say? It's another no. To the ninth publisher, what do you say? Tenth publisher, what do you say? Eleventh publisher, what do you say? Twelfth <laughs> publisher, what do you say? Still no. I mean, come on, guys. Now, I know it's a bit of a joke, but it's 12 no's in a row. I want you guys just to feel for a second, and I'm sure everybody here in this room has been rejected. Show of hands. 
Who's been rejected and been given a no? What about 12 no's in a row by the best people in the industry? How would you feel? Would you give up? That's it. The book is not good enough, you would say to yourself. Let me just put it under that bed. I'll read it to my daughter, and that's where it's going to go. But she sends it to the 13th publisher, and what do you say? And you give her the yes. Right? When I talk about, it's so easy to write. It's so easy to say, you've got to be resilient. You've got to be dedicated. You've got to be persistent. But we've already recognized now, it's not easy. Those words are tough, right? But she did it. She was dedicated. She was resilient. She was persistent to go through all 12 no's to get that one yes. Because that one yes might be just around the corner. And you don't know what, how far it's going to be, right? That publisher gave her, her the launch of the first 1,000 copies of Harry Potter. They're worth now, they're vintage. They're worth now around $100,000 each. And then, of course, you guys know what happened to the Harry Potter brand. It exploded. Those 1,000 copies sold out. Then Warner Brothers wanted the movie rights of the franchise. The brand now, the Harry Potter brand now, is worth $25 billion dollars. And that's how J.K. Rowling became richer than the queen, ladies and gents. So that's a story of persistence, dedication, and resilience. I know it's so easy to write up here. It's so easy to say. But I'm talking about, th was that well-deserved? Yes, absolutely. All right. So let's get back to this. What else do these people do? Okay. So they, I, I want to I say they're teachable. Do you agree? I love the quote, I know nothing. Right? No matter how much you know about your industry, about your field, we still, I know nothing. Right? We're teachable. We can't go out there saying, I know everything. Right? They're teachable. What else do they do? Passion. Well, did I just hear passion? Because I think passion is, I love being passionate. Passionate, they're passionate about whatever they are doing, regardless what industry they're in. What else? I've been told I've, been, I've got three minutes, so let's do this quickly. What else do they do? Committed, yeah. I'll tell you, they have vision, right? I mean, I'm based out of Dubai, and I would say that is probably one of the most visionary cities that I've ever lived in with Sheikh Mohammed. And look at the Burj Khalifa. What a visionary building. If you only knew the story about Burj Khalifa, please read it up. Read about it. He rejected so many models before they even created the Burj Khalifa because he knew it wasn't good enough until he got to that. And now, when I drive past the Burj Khalifa, no doubt every single time, it's still a wow. Okay, so what else do they do? Yeah? I would say they're adaptable to change. Do you agree? They have to be adaptable to change. Is everything going to go your way? Absolutely not. All right, what else? They're confident... Absolutely. They're disciplined. They're disciplined. What else? What else? They're risk takers. The higher the risk, the higher the return, right? I love this. Their words equals actions, meaning whatever they say they'll do, their actions have to be the same, right? You'll see leaders, if they're going to say they're going to do something, they will actually do it. All right, what else? Now, we can go to town here. We can say, yeah, they've got belief in themselves, right? What else? They're strategic. I love that. They're strategic. They're solutions orientated, right? They don't, do they focus on the problems? Do these people focus on problems? They focus on the solutions. But there's one big thing that they do. I'm going to circle it up here. There's one big, big thing that they do, which differentiates them from the rest. They, they don't mind failure. They're okay with failure. I'll quickly tell you. Responsibility. They take responsibility whether they fail or whether they succeed. Is everything going to plan? Is everything going to go to plan? Are we going to make mistakes? 
We're humans. We will make mistakes. It's how we react to our mistakes. Will we take responsibility and say, my bad, that was me, that's on me. That was my mistake. And take full and utter responsibility for everything that they do, right? One of Richard Branson's businesses lost millions. And the biggest thing, I want you to know what he did. And I know for a fact he wasn't overly responsible for the day-to-day -day running of that business. There was other people. But what did he do when he was at that press conference and the media were all over him saying, what happened to those millions of dollars that were lost? And he said, you know what? I take full responsibility. And I admire that man so much. Now, let's go talk about what these people do below the line. I'm sure you've met some of these people. <laughs> what do these people do? Tell me. Oh, I'm getting a lot of passion here. They're lazy. <laughs> they complain. Did I hear complain? They make excuses. They tell all these stories, you know, as to why they haven't achieved things. What else? Negative. Oh, I got negative. I People get really passionate at this point of the exercise because you're like, I know these people, right? They're negative. What else? Yeah, I mean, I love. They're entitled. They think the world owes them something, right? Okay, and the biggest thing that they do. Hello. Yeah. They blame, and I'm sure you've met these people. They'll blame everybody else for everything else they haven't achieved. Why they're not successful, they'll blame their mums. I had one woman that I coached, and she was, you know, the reason why, Shireen, I haven't been successful is because, you know, I come from a very humble family, and I didn't go to the school that I wanted, and I didn't go to the university that I wanted, which means that I didn't get the job that I wanted. Wow. I could tell you, I could show you people that didn't even go to school that became millionaires, right? True. So, I mean, these are, what is she doing? She's providing excuses and she's blaming others, her poor family and the family status as to why she hasn't succeeded. Is that fair? Is that realistic? Is that what successful people do? Absolutely not. So, you want to have a shift of mind. You want to have that leadership mindset and you want to know how these people, why these people succeeded is because it was a conscious decision. It was a conscious decision to live above that line of life, not making excuses, not blaming other people, taking 100% responsibility for their actions and for their doing. And that's how you live up here. So if this is the only thing that I get to teach people in what I do, that's what I want to leave you guys with. I'm Sheree Matwelli, guys. I hope that each and every one of you remembers this for life. And it's a conscious decision that you will make to live above the line. I'm Shreem Mitwali. Bye for now. Thank you.